Good afternoon. Um, we're calling the meeting for Policy Management Committee. And I'd like to have everyone introduce himself or herself. And I'll start with Pat and we'll go around. Oh, they're just getting here. OK. Thank you. Pat O'Neill, member of the board. Nate Tinbite, student member of the board. Lori Christina Webb, chief of staff for the board. Robin Seabrook, Director of Governance, Policy, and Community Relations for the Board. Victoria Van Dyke, Board Staff. Maureen McNamara, Office of the General Counsel. Stephanie Williams, Associate General Counsel. Aranza Labad, Executive Director, Office of School Support and Improvement. Essie McGuire, Executive Director, Chief Operating Office. Tracy Foster, Executive Director, Office of the Chief Academic Officer. Pete Chevney, Chief Technology Officer. Nikki Hazel, Associate Superintendent, Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs. And good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Smondrowski, uh, Board of Education, District 2. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, informational summary is here from September 12th. Are there any comments on that or any changes? Yep. You're okay with it? All right. <coughs> then we'll move on. Um, we'll start on the first agenda item, which is uh, Policy IGS technology and I'm turning this over to Stephanie Williams thank you good afternoon I think it would be helpful if uh, before we actually look at the policy itself we take a few minutes to orient ourselves as to um, the work that has been done and what we're doing going forward and I know that each of you have um, the materials either online or in a binder uh, before you and I just want to kind of uh, start um, looking at tab one and that kind of takes us on our uh, retraces our journey um, on this policy development and sets the stage for where we're going forward um, the first item under that tab is the first item under that tab is uh, I'm just providing this information as, as way of background um, for you the first item under that tab is the um, board policy IGS educational technology proposed framework and this is work um, done by the board policy committee mem um, meet members um, about a year ago giving us guidance on how you wanted us to move forward and I'd like to call your attention to on the back page of that framework um, at the bottom in F you will see a list of MCPS um, regulation uh, regulations that are related to educational technology as part of our work and our uh, benchmarking with other districts throughout the state as well as um, nationally we've shown it showed that MCPS like many other jurisdictions dis uh, addresses much of its um, uh, content related to educational technology through a series of regulations specific to different aspects of technology uh, in a school district but we did not see um, elsewhere or here um, a sort of an overarching uh, visionary statement um, or guiding principles for the overall uh, implementation of educational technology so we've done a, a lot of uh, looked at the research we've looked at state and national standards um, done a lot of uh, internal um, engagement as well as work with a number of our stakeholders to bring to you today a policy that we uh, believe sets forth the board's vision for the implementation of educational technology also in this section um, you have a, a draft of the current policy you also have policy KBA which addresses a good bit of uh, material on student privacy um, you have just a one-page listing of a number of the MCPS uh, technology-related web pages, just to give you background on um, the many ways that we address educational technology uh, in the system at the moment. Uh, still in tab one, next to the last item in that tab, um, is an annotated version of our current policy. And we hope that this will be helpful to you as you consider this work going forward. Um, the, and so how we, where, we, where we've been and where we're going. Um, the driving issues in 1993 when this policy was developed, you'll see, um, I'm looking at the version that's like this with the little boxes on the side. Um, you'll see that the issues that were important at that time were 
creating the concept of creating equity through connectivity. We've kind of learned a lot since then that it takes a little more than connectivity to get that equity balance. Um, it talked about integrating technology into the curriculum, but it only just barely touched the surface of that, and not, not to the extent that we are now seeing technology embedded in our curriculum. And there was a heavy focus on infrastructure. Um, and so those little boxes I referenced will guide you to where uh, those concepts are in our new draft um, that we will be talking about today. So the last item in that tab I will direct you to is the draft one with today's date uh, for policy IGS. And this policy sets forth um, five guiding principles, um, which I will highlight in a moment. And um, it reaffirms our commitment to equity, uh, addressing equity through technology. Um, it talks about the, it talks in more depth about embedding technology into our curriculum. Um, in just a moment, you're going to meet. Um, well, you're not going to meet, but you're going to hear from <laughs> our Associate Superintendent of Curriculum and Instructional Programming, as well as our Chief Technology Officer that are going to t provide for you an overview of the um, certain aspects of, of the policy. But I want to just frame for you their discussion by highlighting the five principles that this, uh, under which this policy is organized. And that includes, uh, first, technology is an integrated part of the teaching and learning process that supports curricular goals. Staff and students use technology resources capably, actively, and responsibly. Third, technology supports students in meeting diverse learning needs and pursuing a range of interests. Fourth, MCPS provides a comprehensive and functional technology infrastructure to support instruction and operations. And fifth, MCPS will engage with multiple stakeholders to shape, advance, and accelerate the board's vision for empower le learning. Um, this has been, um, in addition to um, review of uh, MSDE state standards, which are, this has been developed uh, uh, <coughs> with a review of MSDE and national standards. Um, uh, and it has also been done in collaboration with community stakeholders, and that collaboration will continue on an ongoing basis. Some of those uh, stakeholders are, are listed here. Um, the standards are provided. Um, again, I mentioned that we're using state standards, International Society for Technology and Education, so we're using national standards. And we are uh, referring to standards uh, put forth by the Office of um, Department of Education in their Office of Education Technology. So the, per the key provisions that we are going to be talking about today will be incorporating those standards and findings from the view of the benchmark and research. And we are refocusing our uh, existing policy to include not only the board's vision for the infrastructure, but also to talk about key principles for guiding the integration of our technology into teaching, learning, and operations, and embed it into the curriculum. Now Ms. Hazel, Hazel will pick up from here. All right, good afternoon. So again, just want to reiterate the key principles. Um, and we just want to highlight that technology is an integrated part of teaching and learning that supports curricular goals and the expectation that our staff and students use technology responsibly and that technology supports students in meeting diverse learning needs and pursuing a range of interests. Um, okay, so first talking about supporting our curricular goals. Oh, sorry, we're... Sorry, that's me. Okay, she's got it. <laughs> she got, got it, we're on it. Okay, sorry. Okay. That's okay. All right. Um, first, in terms of supporting curricular goals, uh, instructional practices and the use of technology should be evidence-based and purposeful, and the selection of the instructional resources should enhance the teaching and learning and offer additional paths 
for students to demonstrate their learning. Our students learn in a variety of ways and therefore it's our responsibility to provide instructional materials um, in a variety of modalities and different learning styles, including direct instruction, um, blended learning, and distance learning. And so it talks about this here. Um, next is um, capable, active, and responsible use of technology. Um, in order for teachers to effectively support student learning through the use of technology, professional learning is required to ensure teachers are able to utilize um, assessment and instructional technology resources to best maximize uh, the achievement and learning of our students. And those resources really do focus a lot on balance and uh, this is really important, we know, to a lot of uh, folks in our community. Um, while we know technology is really important um, to our students today, we need to make sure that our po po policy reinforces the idea that there should be appropriate balance um, between how much technology our students are exposed to during the school day and that we offer instructional approaches such as the print text, um, social interaction between our um, other students and interaction between other types of instructional materials and we need to ensure that we're monitoring the amount of time our students are on um, our technology. So it's important. In order for our teachers to effectively support um, student learning through the use of um, technology, um, professional learning is required and um, we need to make sure that we um, are providing that professional learning, helping our teachers um, understand when to um, give students the timing, how to sit, um, teach students how to sit um, at uh, particularly with our younger students at the computer, um, when to monitor, when they've had too much time at the computer. So all of those things are going to be um, really important for our students. Equity and access is, is our final area um, at, with the instruction. We must consider um, equity implications when assigning students homework and other tasks outside of school, the school setting, and require technology. Um, some students may face challenges with connectivity and therefore using a variety of instructional modalities will be necessary. Um, MCPS will ensure that textbooks, digital devices, print and digital learning resources um, will be distributed in a way that makes them usable across the widest range of individual for, uh, variability. So turn it over. Thanks, so good afternoon. I'm gonna talk about two different issues in the policy. Um, the first uh, deals with data privacy and data security, and the second deals with technology infrastructure, and that really deals with communication infrastructure as well as devices, et cetera. I'll talk about both. So um, in 1993, data privacy and security, it's safe to say, was not a big priority in the IT world, especially in education. But times certainly have changed. As we think about the data breach of a couple weeks ago, where we work with the company to quickly identify and stop the hack problem, identify the student who was involved, as well as to mitigate and correct the problem for the future. These things happen on a regular basis. Um, I'm not making this story up. This appeared and was sent to me yesterday from the Washington Post, where students in Pennsylvania hacked the school system and got confidential information to um, to win a water gun fight. This was in the, in the Washington Post. So hacking occurs for a lot of reasons. Some mischievous, some nefarious, but mostly mischievous for students. Um, however, our continued commitment to make sure this moving target is addressed is something I want to thank you all for because it does involve resources and time and money. And we at MCPS are continuing to make sure that this issue is addressed. Um, another um, issue is formalizing our cyber attack protocol, and you saw some, some pieces of that as well, the document that was sent forth. Um, we are going to make sure that um, aside from what goes out from MCBS, how we address cyber attacks, because we know this will not be the mm -hmm. last attack, um, is addressed in a very formal and IT industry uh, way, um, as well as to enable our stakeholders to appeal 
um, the blocking or allowing of student of, of websites. So right now we have uh, a blocking and unblocking of sites according to mismanagement of, um, of, of URLs. So what happens is sometimes appropriate sites that are good for teaching and learning are blocked because they're attached to, for example, GoDaddy, which is a very big web server um, place, and GoDaddy probably has some inappropriate things. So what happens is teachers say to us, we want to get to a American History Revolution site that is on GoDaddy, and we can unblock that. Um, we want to develop a formal way to allow stakeholders, students, teachers, parents, et cetera, to unblock sites to request an unblocking of sites that are currently blocked or blocking of sites. So those two are things that are going to happen over the next couple months. Um, as well as uh, right now we block for legitimate purposes. Um, we're going to work with our general counsel's office as well as the CAO's office to make sure that process is in place. Our goal is February 1st. Um, when we talk about infrastructure, there are three real issues with infrastructure. First is instruction, second is operations, and third is communications. Um, with respect to instruction, um, we're constantly looking at what technology is best for the classroom, what is most affordable, and what is most effective. One example of something that we are looking to improve right now is smart boards. So right now we know we had some issues with some older smart boards this summer. Um, we're looking at a four-year plan to replace those uh, pending uh, continuity of funding, but we're also looking at the newer smart boards, which are really smart panels, they look like big TVs, that have a 10-year bulb life, 10 plus years, so you don't have to replace <laughs> the bulbs, and if you're, you, you are in schools, you know that that's a big issue. Um, they're also wireless, so that teachers can um, project to the device and communicate with the device back and forth from anywhere in the classroom, and they're also portable. So those things are something that we are looking at, and they're also the same price now as they were for the smart boards that were in the past. So those are examples of ways that we are looking to improve instruction. We've also doubled our bandwidth from 10 to 20 gigs last year, and we're looking to double the bandwidth as well from 20 to 40 gigs over the next year. And we have to look at some equipment upgrades to make that happen so that in classrooms, teachers can access and students can access what they need to learn whenever they need to learn it as quickly as they need to. So um, with respect to operations, um, our ERP and SIS upgrades are not small projects. So we're looking at big processes there and upgrades. And then with respect to communication, finally, um, we are looking at a couple things. One is our com commitment to professional development. Um, this summer, we added a compliance module for communication of technology so that our staff can become more digitally literate. And then also, um, we are looking at enabling our new SIS, so next summer, um, a way to easily send classroom, school, or system-based information back and forth to staff to, to stakeholders so to students or to parents and guardians etc quickly and easily in the language that they choose so they can say whatever their home preferred language is and that information automatically gets translated over so that's something we're also looking to do hmm. can I just ask, no, go what, ahead. what kind of information are you talking about so anything at a school, at a classroom level, so it could be anything from a homework assignment to a system-based piece of information like schools are closed for a snow day or something like that. Either one, what happens is on the back end, the, the parent or guardian says what their home language is and the information instantly uses Google or Microsoft Translate and translates instantly to them as well as it provides the English version below so that the, it, in case the translation is not 100%. Thank you. Anything? Oh, so, um, you mentioned smart boards being smaller now and being portable. You mean within the classroom? Correct. Okay. So if a teacher moves around the classroom, so that maybe uh, that yeah. you know now they're attached to a wall, so yes, they can't they really are. change. Yeah. Now they can move that smart board on wheels around to the room. All they need is an outlet. Okay. So they're wireless, so that the teacher can workstation-wise and smart board-wise can move things according to what's best for teaching and learning. Thank you. Welcome. Go ahead. Oh. Um, you recently, or you just mentioned a compliance module that you all just added. Could you please talk about that a little bit more? 
Yeah, so this summer was the first summer we had an IT compliance module where teachers learned how to, aside from things like how to identify and work with phishing and other types of email scams, they also learned how to um, assess online digital tools to better meet the needs of FERPA and COPA compliance and other things like that. So, and our goal is every year to kind of improve that so that digital liter literacy, does not, it's not a top-down thing, but more of a teacher-driven kind of a knowledge base issue. So, Mike, I'm going to tack on about the smart boards. Sure. Um, you mentioned you were had, so, you know, we've spent a lot of years and a lot of money getting the Promethean boards put in. Hopefully most of our schools have it in almost all of their classrooms. Um, the smart boards, they wouldn't be, we're not, that would be replacing Promethean boards as they need to be replaced. We're, we wouldn't be switching them out correct correct we're looking at replacing the old ones that some of them are not even touch screens i didn't realize promethean made non-touch smart boards <laughs> some of them are sold they're before touch so we're looking to replace the old ones end of life end of you know use ones and then slowly work our way up so that we always have newer boards and not useless boards in classrooms so for the schools that do have classrooms or whatever that currently don't have a Promethean board, rather than su supplying a Promethean board, you'll go look to the smart board. Correct. Our goal now is anything we purchase new, and mm -hmm. this has gone on for the last few months, um, is the smart, are the smart board, smart um, TVs versus, uh, versus the smart boards, the older smart boards. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, and another question I had is, um, I didn't know if you want to talk at all about the partnerships with for technology resources for our students that because it was mentioned um, in the slides um, that some students may have uh, difficulty accessing internet services or um, device electronic devices. I don't know if you want to talk about that and then I had one more class. Question. Sure. So um, we have four different programs right now we're doing on with respect to students who have no device or technology at home. Mm -hmm. The first is the Verizon program where students at three different schools are were were given uh, middle schools were given um, tablets connected uh, iPads that they can use at home as well for free and they're connected to Verizon um, that's one program there's a split one million program for high school age students who have need um, and that program allows them to either have bring home a modified device or tablet connected and they have um, they can use those as well for homework and there's no cost to the students for either one of those um, the third program is that we have a checkout program we're implementing this now um, where the students can go to the media centers and check out a modified device which is a connected connectivity to the internet mm -hmm. for students who do, do not have internet at home and they can bring that home and they are heavily filtered and controlled but then they can do homework etc at home and then the fourth is that we look at um, recycling our older Chromebooks as we replace those and allowing students to take those home as well Oh, that's no good devices. to hear because you know I wasn't sure what we did with them when they're we're looking older. Um, my last question is just about virtual classrooms and what we're doing in terms of um, expanding those opportunities and monitoring how or putting together how that might work. Um, I don't know if we have any right now. Um, I know that we have some schools, particularly our smaller schools, where there's the enrollment isn't necessarily high enough to offer some of our classes like a particular foreign language or anything like that. Um, are we utilizing the technology to address any of that kind of thing where someone could be teaching it at a different school and kids could be in a room, classroom with a pair or something? So we are actually looking into the, the idea of virtual classrooms now. Um, we don't have a lot of that happening at this time, but we do have um, kind of a hybrid model where we have some technology programs for, for language where we have um, program a language program where a teacher may use a program um, and then uh, so they'll go in teach using that program and then they may leave the classroom and then a teacher may um, implement or have that program available for t students to use independently while the teacher is away so it's kind of a hybrid uh, model so we have that taking place um, currently in some schools and we're doing some of that at the elementary level. Does, it, does um, that seem like something worth? Does that seem like something that has 
that we're going to continue to grow on? We're or? just getting started okay. in that area. Um, so we'll, we're looking to see if that's something that we can grow. Um, but um, that's a program that we're kind of piloting right now at this time. Okay. And in support of Ms. Hazel, uh, what I want to say is two or three years ago, the technology was very cost ineffective to do that. But mm -hmm. now, with the bandwidth that we have and the support structure we have, it's much more cost effective to do, and they're looking to expand those programs because of that. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Jenbite, anything? Ms. O'Neill? No, just as we get into the policy, the issue of the balance between technology and uh, human contact interaction, you know, and, uh, you know, I know it was referenced in the opening comments, but I think it definitely does need to be reflected. I mean, technology is something here to stay, and our uh, digital natives will, that will continue to be a part of their lives. Um, so, I, it, but finding the, the right balance in an instruction. Yeah, I, I, was, I think the inter, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say at the elementary level with our new curriculum, the um, literacy curriculum, I think about 50% of the literacy curriculum is digital. Um, I think the same is true for uh, the secondary literacy curriculum and with the mathematics. Um, more of it is digital, and so we are working with our teachers on making sure that there's that balance for our students. Um, I know digi digital citizenship, uh, I know that we must do that. Does everybody do this, or is it part of the compulsory training? I'm just, I don't know, I don't remember taking it, but. I don't remember taking it. I don't know that there's a formalized program across the district yet, but I think that that is a p becoming a part quickly of many different subjects yeah. to yes yeah, so to, we have common sense education yeah um, and um, there are lessons that are embedded in to the curriculum and mm -hmm. uh, sc schools will implement them in either uh, literacy or social studies or health and sometimes mm -hmm. counselors will go and implement some of the common sense education lessons okay. I'm sorry I didn't say what that was cyber bullying um, hate and what else Anyhow, bad speech and all that kind of thing. So, you, so you're, you're sure that uh, it's embedded in the curriculum, which is really a great idea. And I know you were alluding to interactive um, teaching, but even with uh, interactive teaching, if you have a person who's on this side with the students, the other side needs a teacher as well. So we just need to know that we cannot eliminate staff by doing this. Um, there was a study in here that said 20% of the high school students bring their own devices uh, to school. Is that pretty much true here? They, they bring laptops, cell phones, and tablets. I think I'm going to refer to Mr. Timbite to be able to answer that from his experience because he probably knows more than we do it's on true. this answer. <laughs> and it's definitely more than 20%. Yeah, it's more than that. This study, I don't know where it was done. and. Um, 61% in this study did not have internet access at home. I, I hope that it's not that. Our numbers here are around 9%. Oh, that's much better. Report. I don't know where this thing was done. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I have one more quick question. Um, I didn't remember seeing anywhere, and I'm trying to go back because I got this a little while ago, but um, the safety, safe usage in terms of um, you know, some people have talked about switches or something that turn the the wireless. And or how do we maintain um, regular check-ins as to whether or not to make sure that the wireless, whatever it is, radiation or I'm not sure what it is that people are specifically concerned about. But um, how are we making sure that these are safe devices to have on and around our kids and teachers or so staff? Sorry. So the RF radiation is what you're referring to, and usually that deals with the access points, which are, I'm looking in the room here, they're made safer and safer every every year, and our equipment actually can look at when they're used, when they're not, when they're maximized, when they're not. We also have tools when people ask questions about that to go and look at the radiation amount, and our numbers are very low as far as the system and consistent across schools. So I'm very comfortable right now as that becomes safer and safer that those are not 
there are more waves coming from the outside. Right. I hate to and say that, phones. right? <laughs> as, uh, then, or from the inside, if that's in your pocket, then the wireless access point in the room. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Um, you mentioned that 9% of our students don't have Wi-Fi access at home. How is that number measured? We did a survey at the end of last year, and we asked students. Um, and I, uh, the number 9% is what we came, what we found. But I don't know that we asked K through 12. So I don't know if that's real. Like parents could easily have said to students, "You're not allowed to access the internet," so they put down the. I don't know the answer, but I, the number we got was about nine percent of lack of no internet at home, and that's individual students. So it could be families dropping down to five percent. We're not really sure, which is where a family could check out that MiFi device, bring it home, and everyone can use it in the house according to their homework needs if they want to. Thank you. Uh, my last question is about the effectiveness of programs that we have purchased for teachers to use. Have you had any feedback on that? Do they feel comfortable with it? Is it efficient? Does it do what it's supposed to do? And I, we probably are at early stages on that, but I'll just leave that with you. Well, we have a lot of programs, mm -hmm. so um, that's difficult to say. We have programs embedded into our curriculum um, in terms of tech we can talk about technology we have different sites and links and um, so it's, are you talking about like the new curriculum or any curriculum that uh, we've purchased and uh, I think in general do teachers feel that it's effective and it works well with students I mean you're probably getting some anecdotal feedback yes just met with principals an hour ago um, <laughs> I'm getting lots of feedback um, Yes, so I think that um, it's interesting that the technology is a piece of the feedback that I'm getting, mm -hmm. um, particularly um, at the secondary level because currently they can't um, modify the technology. And um, slightly by design, we mm -hmm. want them to implement it as it's designed in its first year. And um, mm -hmm. so that's a little frustrating for some, um, but we want them to um, really implement the curriculum and learn it the way it's designed mm -hmm. and so that we can figure out how to support the teachers and then figure out how we can modify it if necessary. But we really need to figure out um, what the struggles are with, the, with implementation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, any other comments? We should go back to Ms. Williams. Are you? Completely finished with everything here? No further questions or comments? No, no further questions so far. So, uh, may I have a motion to see if we send this to the uh, full board? We send it out for public comment first or no? Well, we'll it'll it'll go it for the full board. It'll go for, well, uh, I'll move that we move this forward to the full board. Okay, thank Second. you. Second. Yeah, we all agree. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chavanini and Ms. Hazel. Okay, we are now on to um, discussion of policy BOA legal services. And Ms. Williams will begin, and she'll lead the uh, discussion on that policy. Okay, this is uh, uh, an update um, on a policy that has uh, not been updated uh, uh, since 2009. And so it's not dramatically different from what you've seen in the past with, with the purpose and direction of the policy in the past. Uh, what we intend to do with these updates is to emphasize the importance of proactive legal problem solving, promoting collaborative dispute resolution, and engaging in strategic decision making to promote equity and ac academic excellence for all students. Um, it reflects that in consultation with the board, the superintendent and other appropriate administrators, the general counsel is responsible for overall management of legal services. When this policy was, uh, throughout the existence of this policy, was prior to a ge general counsel um, serving directly to the, to the district. Uh, so it's been updated to reflect that change. Um, it still uh, references that outside counsel may still be engaged uh, when highly specialized legal expertise is required 
that will, of course, be done under the close, of, close uh, oversight provided by the general counsel and the superintendent. Um, and the superintendent and the general counsel shall consult with the board regarding settlement of legal claims with significant budgetary and programmatic implications. So those are a few of the highlights of the changes that um, have been are proposed for this policy. All right. Any questions? You want to walk through she, it? You'd like for us yeah. to walk through it? Yeah. 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 I know, yeah, go through the part where the language has changed. Okay, so we start with um, legal services, um, the purpose of legal services, and this is where we reflect that the goals of the legal services management plan um, shall facilitate the cost-effective, creative, and proactive legal problem solving. Um, this, of course, is done at the highest quality to assist the board and the superintendent and other board staff when they're navigating legal requirements, evaluating and managing legal risk, aligning and conserving resources, um, and when possible, engage in de decision, strategic decision making uh, on behalf of the district. So always looking to promote the equity um, and academic excellence for all students. So section B, um, the implementation strategy, starts with the management of legal services. Um, this sets forth that in consultation and collaboration with the board and the superintendent and other administrators, the general counsel is, of MCPS is responsible for overall management and this inc of legal services. And this includes providing timely advice um, and counsel on personnel issues, student matters, special education policy development, real estate, land use, civil rights, um, any other, any legal issues that have implications for the operation of the school district. Um, this uh, plan includes conducting and supervising all aspects of litigation administrative agency proceedings in which the board, the superintendent of school, or other staff acting in the course of their duties for MCPS are named plaintiffs or defendants. Um, and this includes, but it's not limited to, support for special education um, uh, um, proceedings consistent with policy BLC. The plan also includes monitoring and, and evaluating internal and external providers of legal services, including, pardon me, the process for the selection and oversight of outside counsel, and coordination with our county attorney's office um, as, as appropriate because they, on occasion, uh, certain circumstances, provide counsel to the board through the self-insurance fund. The, the uh, plan also includes providing legal re review and advice regarding the drafting, negotiation, execution, and implementation of contracts and other agreements, whether that's with our relationship with government agencies, vendors, contractors, or others in support of our mission. Uh, number The fifth uh, aspect of managing the legal services, proactively anticipating and addressing legal issues relevant decision relevant to decision making by the board and MCPS staff, and that's going to include the impact of state and federal legisl legislation, judicial decisions, um, and facilitating a review of key MCPS initiatives with significant legal implications. So, sort of a proactive approach. Um, supporting the work of the board in consultation with the superintendent to review, update, and revise board policies. So the general counsel coordinates the management of all the legal services for the board, the superintendent of, of schools, and the district as a whole, um, except in those limited circumstances where the board may require legal support of its in fulfillment of its quasi judicial responsibilities um, to adjudicate, adjudicate appeals and hearings, uh, challenging actions by the um, actions by the superintendent. Um, the next section is not changed much as it speaks to the selection, retention, and oversight of outside counsel. <laughs> uh, this continues on page six regarding the general counsel works closely with outside counsel reviewing strategies um, that are implemented by uh, outside counsel. Um, so that's to ensure consistency and avoid duplication of cost and effort and so forth. And in the reporting and review section, um, it references um, 
new section, general counsel, in collaboration with the superintendent of schools and other staff, will provide legal advice and regular updates on legal matters, including pending or potential litigation, consistent with Section 3350B of the um, general provisions of the Maryland Annotated Code, and that we shall the general counsel shall consult with the board regarding settlement of legal claims with significant budgetary programmatic implications. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Dr. Daka? I, I just have a question around, um, or suggestion, around the management of legal services, number 5B, um, providing legal counsel except for those limited circumstances and talks about quasi-judicial matters. Um, we should probably also add and matters regarding employment evaluation and the contract for the superintendent because that's an area where our legal counsel. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. I, oh, thank you. It was in here, so some, we had a, we must have had a version control process because okay. that was in there, <laughs> okay. uh, and it will be in there. Thank you. Good catch. <laughs> thank you. Ms. O'Neill. I move we send this to the full board. Second. All in, all in favor? And having a general counsel's office, I think, has saved us quite a bit of funding. <laughs> so thank you so much for the work that you do. And well, Jeanette was here, but thank you, Mr. Seven. Okay. We're on to, um, I forgot what. Okay, we're on to JEE, -E, a policy JEE, -E, student transfer. Okay, Ms. Williams again will be discussing this, um, updating this policy. Thank you. So um, we have been working on um, revisions to policy JEE. Well, we have been working on issues related to policy JEE for quite some time now. As you know, we, um, at the request of Mrs. Dixon, this item was refer referred to the Policy Management Committee um, to consider um, the uh, um, implementation of the policy with particular respect, consideration of the shifting demographics of our, of our county, and with particular attention to how hardship decisions have been made. As we've gone through this conversation for the last 15 or so months, um, a number of topics have come up, um, not the least of which is recent efforts by our state board to take in to, to revise um, the regulations to set forth a new standard of review that would be based on uh, the best interest of the child. So we have some hot off the press information, and that is that the board, state board has just voted to rescind the proposed regulations. So the time that we would have spent at this table talking about that um, we'll pass on that, um, unless you just have a comment about it. But that is, um, we had had much discussion um, as to what direction this board should go, given those pending, and the committee wisely decided to keep moving forward with this work, not knowing what the outcome of the state board's efforts would be. And I'm told on that front that it's worth listening to the state board's um, proceedings on that front because uh, I think that the comments that Maeve and Pazam put in about the importance of this being a local concern, so exactly what the board is doing here in terms of looking at their own uh, approach to this as opposed to a uniform standard across the state, this will, this, the, 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 this uh, aligns with the process that this committee has done about continuing to move forward on this. Thank you. Okay, so our work today focuses on language that staff is, um, is presenting in response to the last two to three policy management committee um, meetings and the direction that we have been given. So on several topics in this, um, um, within, embedded within this policy. So I'd like to direct your attention starting on page two. The lang their language has been pr is provided to significantly expand um, the definition and application of um, our uh, term unique hardship. Uh, some of the language we have 
carried over from our previous policy, but we are being more specific where we say at this time by saying students may apply for a COSA when extenuating circumstances related to their specific physical, mental, or emotional well-being or their family's individual or personal situation that could be mitigated by a change of school environment. Um, and then we have um, the language from the prior policy and, and regulation re referencing problems that are common to large numbers of families do not constitute unique hardship, absent compelling factors, documentation that can be independently verified must accompany all requests, um, and then we move into some examples. And for the first time, we are very specific with our examples. We start with child care. The parents and guardians must demonstrate extenuating circumstances in obtaining age-appropriate supervision of school students before and after uh, because their work hours extend significantly beyond the typical um, hours for available care and uh, programs and activities within the school or otherwise easily accessible child care and or significant financial constraints limit the family's ability to otherwise access child care. The next example of a, of a unique hardship would be when there are extenuating circumstances involving the physical, mental, or emotional well-being of the student. Um, this sets forth that the parents or guardians should set forth by the documentation of the student's um, physical, mental, or emotional well-being directly related to or impacted by the school environment or in the case of a significant health issue, um, again, they would provide documentation of that. And on page four, we provide language that reflects the work that staff currently does on an ongoing basis, but advises families that this is an, an option for them. In the absence of such documentation, evidence of such extenuating circumstances may be obtained through consultation with school staff. So that is reflective of circumstances when families present a request for COSA, um, but it's not necessarily, the request is not necessarily accompanied by a letter from a, a therapist or other healthcare practitioner. Our staff often, um, on behalf of students, picks up the phone, calls a school, talks to folks who are familiar with the child's circumstances and works through. Yeah, and we had a lengthy discussion about that because I think it was in Fairfax County we felt that it could create inequitable situations, so this provides, you know, um, more uh, more compassion for families in circumstances that may not be able to afford therapists, et cetera. That's right, and 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 again, it's the the board is bringing forth this option. Um, that while staff has been doing it, it's not ne not sure that all families would know that um, this is something that could be done. So this is helpful that the board is putting that forward in this in in this context. Um, the section B ninety two through one hundred two regarding family moves. This isn't a necessarily a change. It isn't a change. Uh, it's a change to the language that's in the policy. However, the last time the policy was changed, we updated this section in the regulation, and we thought it would be helpful to just move forward the language that's in the regulation into the policy. So it speaks to family moves. With respect to family moves, students whose families have moved within Montgomery County who wish to continue attending their former home school may request a COSA without demonstrating a unique hardship. These uh, requests are considered for the remainder of the current school year only with the exception that students in grades 11 or 12 can stay until they graduate from high school. Uh, the sections where you see the, the highlighting for siblings, that's just formatting. There's no change there. Um, Section D is regarding MCPS employees. I'm at, on page 5 at line 126. Um, this section sets forth that consistent with MCPS strategic priorities to encourage and support employees who work in Title I uh, Innovative School Year Calendar or Focus Schools, parents or guardians may request a COSA for their child to attend one of these schools if that parent or guardian will be assigned for the upcoming school year to work in a budgeted full-time equivalent position that's eligible for leave retirement and health benefits coverage and the parent is a Montgomery County or guardian is a Montgomery County resident. The superintendent of schools may establish timelines 
as well as limit eligibility based on employee performance or conduct concerns. Um, so, the, I have a question. Um, so currently, um, you know, we don't give any, you know, uh, special treatment to employees for consideration, but they may apply based on a hardship, correct? That's correct. They may apply under the same standards that any other family in, in MCPS would so apply we're, for a COSA. we're referencing giving a priority for Title I focused schools and innovative school calendar. Should we have in this that um, in all, in other circumstances, uh, staff may apply through the normal, uh, to make it more clear, right? That I, I just feel like, it, you know, it seemed from Mr. Neff's presentation about how, um, you know, even considering that you have to have a child care plan in place, but I, I, you know, I don't want staff to think that's gone. You know, I just believe it needs to be stated in here. Okay. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I have a question about um, line 140, 141, um, where that you referenced that um, limited eligibility based on employee performance or conduct concerns. Um, we've heard concerns from um, folks about if the, I mean, the teacher could be doing fine now, I'm, I'm, the staff member, I shouldn't say teacher, could be doing fine now, but then if the, if their child does come with them, then there becomes problems. Do we need to state anything about, um, you know, doing a review or the principal's discretion as to whether or not the situation is working or not working? I mean, I don't know. It goes back to the superintendent, so I guess he can designate whoever he wants. Mr. Stillman. Yeah, I, I think that this is part of the issue that we struggle with in creating this mm -hmm. this whole, this new process is that um, what are some of the unintended consequences of moving forward in this direction? So even that language about performance, um, uh, performance or conduct concerns was tricky to write because what we were trying to say here was that if they were if a, if an employee was in the par process or something like that that that, that, that could be a limitation but we didn't want to just say uh, any concern so we were trying to figure out a, the right way to balance but I think your point is a good one about what if those concerns uh, move after, they get the after. Uh, if it was a concerns about the student, we have the COSA rescission process, mm -hmm. but we don't exactly right. have a comparable process for an employee, nor would we want to. So I think that's the piece that we're, we're trying to grapple with, what's the right thing to do if we go this route uh, towards employees. Well, I just personally feel like at a minimum, th this um, to me implies that it would be that performance would be taken into consideration before approving the COSA. I just think at a minimum we should incorporate somewhere that if performance changes um, after the COSA. I mean, we, we take away COSAs for kids being late when it's their parents who are taking them and dropping them off. Um, I, you know, I'm very supportive of this, this section. <laughs> um, in other words, I believe we should be allowing staff to do it. But I do know that there are some concerns, and I've heard um, stuff from administrators and stuff who like well then it's going to cut into their work duties and and whatever so i just didn't know if we were going to address that at all so i'm sorry so would it be if the staff member or what is is what you're saying if the staff member because one of the things i know that um if there are extending right now if they're extenuating circumstances and they grant a staff they they would make it very clear in the grant that uh this is not a this the staff member should not be uh uh, using other staff in the building or their own classroom for childcare, so maybe something framed around if 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 the if having uh, the child in the same building interferes. becomes a, becomes interferes. a uh, interferes with this with the opera with the with the ability with the of duties. the staff member to yeah. perform their duties. Something like that would be the way to frame it. it. Well, so I mean, Mr. Neff said that as staff members apply for COSAs. Um, and they consider it one of the factors is what is the child care plan for that staff member so um you know having a child care plan in place i mean it is a condition of the approval 
does that get to that? Because you still have the, your con contractual responsibilities. Yeah, I think so. I like I said, for me, it's more of a if if it seems in some way to be disruptive to either your um, your work duties or um, otherwise that it's not a guarantee that once they're there they're they get to stay no matter what I guess is sort of what I'm trying to get at yeah I, I think this mostly affects elementary students mm -hmm. because if they're secondary they right. have seven other teachers to look after them and they have their own schedule so um, yeah it is a concern and but I think uh, the principal can take a, a look at that and decide you know how to handle <laughs> that that issue so before we move forward to the rest of the policy I'd like to direct your attention in, in your materials um, at the last policy management committee meeting you asked that we also consider um, uh, uh, if we move forward with language permitting staff in the title one innovative school year calendar of focus schools that we consider allowing staff who um, work in in central office bus or maintenance depot or other MCPS facility located nearby so there's language proposed in your, in your materials you should have a document like this yep. and hopefully has attachments to it okay so um, the committees the committee said um, <coughs> the committee said with this two facilities nearby um, and so we took the liberty of defining that nearby is within two miles. It could be anything of the board, just for conversation, staff recommended two miles. So um, the proposed, not the proposed, the additional criteria for your consideration, um, this is in response to your suggestion last time, would be as designated by the superintendent. This would follow the language that we have here at line 142 as designated by the superintendent of schools after taking into consideration both grade, both school and grade level capacity and staffing, COSA to, COSAs to Title I, Innovative School Calendar Year of Focus Schools may also be requested by parents or guardians who work at another school that serves different grade levels or at a central office, bus, or maintenance depot or other MCPS facility located within two miles of the schools and as, they, as long as they reside in Montgomery County. Um, additional language that was discussed and should be considered, maybe I should stop there, but this is additional language that was discussed with students who receive COSAs for this reason may articulate to the schools in the feeder pattern of the Title I school, innovative school year calendar, or focus schools. These are issues that um, were raised at the, at the last time and so we're bringing forth language. Just wanted to share with you so that, you know, we have a good picture of, of what this um, language can can lead to um, can look like um, this is a map obviously of our county and, and our schools and it shows um, the centers of each of these multitude of circles are it's in this notebook but I don't know where. Are, are, are one of the um, title one focus or innovative school year calendar schools and a two mile radius around them. And, and then you see the dark tri darkest triangles. Those are uh, f uh, work sites, MCPS work sites, whether they are a depot, uh, a bus transportation depot, a um, maintenance depot, or one of uh, our other facilities, up county regional center, Spring Mill Center, Carver, um, any of those. And so you'll see that many of our facilities are located in alignment with our most highly impacted um, schools um, in the county. And then on the back page, this document shows you this list of representative sampling of some of our facilities within two miles of the referenced schools. Um, in the parentheses beside that, the number of employees that are located at each uh, or, or whose um, um, their code they're coded to each for attendance purposes their work sites are, are considered these various locations 
And we've highlighted in red and yellow and orange, Maryvale, Washington Grove, and Rosemont, just by way of example. Of course, we have no idea how many people in a particular build, how many adults, how many staff members in a particular building, whether it's a facility or a school, would choose to take advantage of this, of this opportunity. But we wanted you to know what the realm of possibilities were. Um, so, so, you know, you see these three schools that if staff of all of the school, all of the facilities that are within two miles of them, these three schools could have a thousand people, staff members who have the option um, to exercise. And it should be noted that the individual schools have a finite number. You know, so any mm -hmm. school that you pick, they know what their staff is. 75, 80, 100 staff members in a building, that's it. But when you expand to, to the facilities, just wanted you to be aware of the potential impact. That's a massive impact, mm -hmm. <laughs> potentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciate this perspective. And, and, I, and I think that um, just looking at that impact as we were preparing for the meeting, I think it, it, it caused us to look back at the original purposes for why I think the board started on this path, which was more to focus on incentivization to uh, uh, teachers and other staff working in Title I and innovative schools and focus schools. So um, if that's the purpose, uh, the, the, the expanse of other facilities nearby can threaten to cause lots of complication and be a different purpose. That's not to say not to do it, but just uh, given the challenges that this map just gives an example of, I think that 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 just caused us to go back to the the original idea and the discussions of the board and figure out to make sure that we're keeping everything aligned in terms of how we're doing this relating to the original purpose for consideration. I appreciate that. I was gonna. I have a comment about the um, the second part here. Um, I don't know if my colleagues wanted to discuss that first part any further before, but the students who receive courses for this reason may articulate to the schools in the feeder pattern of Title I schools, of the schools. I think it should incorporate language that is indi indicates that as long as the teacher stays there. So we wouldn't want somebody working at a school, bringing their child in, and then next year they, they leave, but they're child gets to continue articulating all the way through high school. And this piece also, interestingly, we'll get to it later. Uh, so I th think there's a board interest in uh, re-examining and um, uh, doing uh, eliminating over time the automatic articulation from middle school to high school for students who received ACOSA. So in some ways, putting an articulation piece in here uh, May send a different message than doing away with it there. So I think that was another piece that we wanted to highlight about if we have articulation here, right. what are the implications for the middle to high school articulation and and, and ensuring uh, to the best as we can some consistency across different parts of this policy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I personally think that that should be follow everybody else. Like you, they have to reapply, but that's me. No, I agree with you. I. I I'm not comfortable with this second provision um, because I, you know, I think that um, in the policy we've it, one of the in the draft is the recommendation that we eliminate the automatic from middle to high school. Mm -hmm. And um, we do and, have that language. We'll get to yeah, that. Yeah, and I'm not comfortable in calling separating right. this. Um, you know, I do. Um, you know, it gives me some pause because I do think it should be for other employees, but I understand your, you know, you've increased the universe of people. And one of the things that was called out in the ERS is that, you know, we have many novice teachers in our Title I and Focus schools. We want to incentivize more experienced teachers to go there. And um, this is, in support of that, mm -hmm. um, you know, because I mean, I, I, I know it's a broad assumption, but you know that our first year teachers probably don't have children that, you know, they want to bring along in the building. But um, I just I think we've opened 
a whole big can of worms mm. that we don't know the implications and many of these schools exactly. are already bordering on being overcrowded we want to incentivize experienced teachers um you know yep. going moving forward but I, the second provision i i don't think it's fair i think to, or if we could at least um add verbiage that would indicate that while they have to reapply St. Forcosa at middle school and at high school, similarly to everybody else, we would provide, I don't want to say preferential treatment, or but you know, we would take into uh, additional consideration where they're working. Does that make sense? I'm not sure if I was saying that very yeah, clearly. But I understood but, it. Okay. So, okay, so it was my question in response to that is, when we say that we're adding that the non-teachers who don't work in these identified buildings may apply via COSA process, mm -hmm. um, does that preferential treatment that you just referenced apply to that category? Because now we're putting them back in the same yeah. standard mm -hmm. and the same standard that they have to, no, these teachers have to, these teachers slash, these staff slash parents mm -hmm. um, that are in these title, specifically identified schools continuing in the feeder pattern applying we're in the COSA process but with preferential preferential preference right just a waiting I mean, factor or whatever right we a weighted it. factor yeah mm -hmm. that if you are still if you are a parent who or guardian who is working in one of these identified types of schools and you apply for a COSA it, there would be a weighted um, consideration to the fact that you are Working at one of these schools, and you want your child, and your child went there, and you are continuing in a feeder pattern. So would that waiting be based on capacity of the school? Uh, you know. Well, I mean, like I said, for me, my concern is someone coming and working in a school, high need school for a year or two. Their child comes, and then now they're in a, a feeder pattern that, if they don't ever have to reapply, um, and they leave in two <laughs> years and go to a, you know, a lower need school, I think that. It just that to me defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. And, and I think the other consideration is that if there is an articulation pattern process here, that the so it may be the case that the middle school child of a um, elementary school teacher is going to get preference over the elementary child of a, another elementary school teacher in the same building so that that's going to be another challenge if we do have an articulation process that we're again moving away from incentivizing teachers to be in our title one schools where and have their students their kids there uh, versus uh, teachers who are still there but their kids have now moved on uh, anyway that could be a, a challenge yeah I don't know like I said I'm just not comfortable with this way it's written okay so this is uh, so there's so I'm not hearing support for this second paragraph <laughs> on the additional criteria page. So we just eliminate that, right? right. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the yeah the first paragraph. Well, I think that's a key the one. first paragraph. I, I I think we should table that yeah. thought and mm -hmm. I agree. you know um, see how the incentivizing. <laughs> works um, and see I mean we know that we already <laughs> we have overcrowded schools in a lot of places and you know I, I think we might be creating a whole problem mm -hmm. or exacerbating a problem okay okay any other thoughts on the employee I'm not finished with the policy but any other <laughs> thoughts on the employee related section of the policy okay no um, on page six, COSAs are subject to the following procedures. You see uh, what appears to be new language, but it's just clarifying. We had February 1 to April 1, but we've clarified it's the first school day in February and April, so it's not really new. Um, on page seven, we have uh, lifted um, regulatory language into the policy regarding the COSA application will be approved or denied after considering uh, the reason for the request. Um, for students receiving special education services, whether the IEP can be implemented at the requested school, 
applicable staffing and services available at the school, school capacity, including grade level, cluster capacity, and other issues that implicate the ability of the school to admit new students. Can I jump in here? Mm -hmm. yeah, please do. So um, on line 171, number D, the reassignment from one consortium school to another after lottery assignments are finalized. <coughs> I have, I take um, issue with the fact that if a student um, is enrolled in a school through the lottery process, one of the schools, but that's not their home school, um, and that they don't feel like it's working for them, they frequently will get COSA applications for them to go back to their home school or to be able to go to their home school. And generally, we do not, we don't grant that. But the next following year, they automatically get to go to their home school if they want to. So I don't know, I just feel like I would like to see that addressed somehow in that. Um, Can you? It's just it's something that comes up in appeals frequently, so. I'm not sure I get it. In, when we get the, <laughs> you know, again with, um, <laughs> you selling these? <laughs> <laughs> um, when we get appeals, while the, you know, our, our current policy is that, like you said, if, if my base school is um, Blake, mm -hmm. and I chose, um, and I chose Blake right at the beginning, mm -hmm. I'll get my home school. If in the lottery process I, however, my base school's Blake, and I chose Paint Branch, and I got it, uh, but I changed my mind, I really don't care. <coughs> You're right, what we'll do is when it comes in as an appeal, we will look at all the factors we would normally look at, and if there's not a hardship, and if there is an enrollment concern, We'll say no, but you can get it the next year. We also, though, look into the fact how old's the kid. You know, again, if it's um, if it's a junior, a rising junior or senior, and they're going to get it the next year anyway, the appeal may be granted. So, you know, while it's not automatic, which it's sounding like you think makes sense, the, the implication mm -hmm. would be the unintended consequence would be we get a lot of these. Um, and I wish Jeannie was here because, you know, it, when we have a request, we'll call her and say, we have an appeal. It is the kids' base school. What's it looking like there? Right. Um, and, and I think it goes significantly, uh, and I'm turning to Essie a little bit, to capacity. So that if right. um, a student... Uh, or, or even a, a group of students uh, decide during the course of the year to their Blair is their home school yes. and they base school and they um, and they uh, chosen the lottery Northwood that then a couple months in uh, a couple dozen students deciding to go to Blair may have have significant implications on assignments and capacity and teaching and the like. And so I think that's part of it as well. Do we really worry that that's going to happen? Well, we often, in a, not all the time, but significant numbers of appeals where kids are asking then to go to not necessarily just their base school, but another school in the consortium. The reason will be my friends all got into mm -hmm. X school. I'm at why I want to go with them. So I think that kind of dovetails with what Josh is saying. Um, it could have an impact. And in terms of numbers, since we only get the appeals, I don't know what the initial appeals to the consortia office look like. But I think it's, you know, it's an unknown, kind of like when we were looking at the last issue of staff um, questions. I think it could be a, a problem. Not necessarily, but it, it could be. Yeah, I just, you know, I don't, I, I find it, I would, see it being hard to imagine a bunch of a group of a large group of kids all saying let's just go to a different school and particularly a mid-year um without there being some sort of real issue there but i do know that um like i said from our, when we get our appeals i would just like the opportunity to be able to say well i mean i always do say this anyways but um <laughs> they get to go there next year anyways why don't we just let them go now if they're unhappy because i don't feel like most kids move schools mid-year um without there being some sort of reason. But um, 
Right. Well, generally, the, the appeals we usually get are in the summer. And I think the, the thought was when the consortia process was established was that if you say it up front, you know, you do get your home school. And you're right. The, the kind of catch-22 is, well, you're going to get it next way, right. next year. Um, so that's kind of So how many sides. kids that um, don't get their either their first choice or um, the school that they're now asking to switch to. I know in the letters that we send home to the families, it reads um, something along the lines of, you can apply for the second change or the second? Well, there's <laughs> second round. There's the second round for the initial um, choice lottery process, and then there's change of choice the next February which applies to you saying in Feb. okay, I'm assigned right now at Springbrook. I want to change to Blake next year, but I'm already at Springbrook. You can do change of choice, and it's the end of January, beginning of February. It's a short window mm -hmm. to say, I want to transfer next year. And what we say is, if your change of choice request is for your homes, your base school, excuse me, you'll get it. So we all often put that at the end. Especially in cases like you said, when we are into the school year, say if we were going to get a requesta request mid-year, mm -hmm. you know the response would, you know, absent a hardship, absent any, you know, extenuating circumstances, if it were to be denied, the letter would also say. However, you know, the hearing officer informed the parent you can apply during the change of choice process for the next school year, and given, you know, that Smith High School is your is your base school. <laughs> Since I know I know that the that the committee and the board sort of prioritize the changes that we've pushed for uh, uh, a proposed language today, I'm wondering if this issue about the consortia and change of choice is something that would make sense for us to follow up with some data as this process proceeds, rather than yeah. trying to address now and focus on the ones yeah. we've and does we've it, focused on. I mean. What other implications does it have for the whole consortia process and regs that are governing over the consortia? Right. I think this uh, it, uh, tweaking with the change of choice process could have significant implications mm -hmm. for that. So that would be why I would suggest that we, we think about that as part of that I think process. It was a priority of the board to move forward in changes to the JEE. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get going because we'll be up against the uh, transfer policy. The yeah, I just, if we're doing it, I'd rather do it all at one time rather than and do it right than have to worry about coming back. Yeah, I, but I don't know. I mean, is right. there a policy on the consortia? I mean, and regs? I mean, I'm sure there are regs. Um, yeah. There actually are not uh, a policy and reg on that process. Um, so, if I, I think that it sounds like we, it would be helpful to have data on how many change of choice applications they are, mm -hmm. when they are, and granted to see if this is a concern or if it's really a few things that come to the board every once in a while, that and then we great. can take it from there. Yep, that would be great. All right. Okay. Um, the next set of changes. The next set of changes uh, bring us to page eight. Uh, we reference the, uh, the articulation, automatic articulation, changing the automatic ar current automatic articulation for students who have, been, have received a COSA in middle school to not making that an automatic process. Mm -hmm. So the proposal here is, and I acknowledge this is a little inartful, um, but um, COSAs are not required for students to attend a school other than home school under the following conditions, but we're prefacing it with starting with students who enter sixth grade during the school year 2021, a student attending a middle school on a COSA seeking to attend the high school in that middle school's feeder pattern will have to reapply for a COSA. So that essentially um, creates a grandfather, if you will, um, for students who are starting middle school, um, currently in middle school, starting middle school as of next year. 
next school year, but going forward, there would not be the automatic articulation opportunity. And way back months ago, when we did the comparison of multiple districts, nobody had oh, no. automatic from each level. Mm -hmm. I mean, Correct. There was nobody. Nobody. Many, many of the jurisdictions, probably more than not, of the jurisdictions required a new application at the end of every school year to reassert um, the ongoing hardship. Okay, so, uh, the bottom of page eight. Section four, MCPS shall implement a process separate from the COSO process described in this policy for the purpose of considering academic transfer requests for high school students other than for students who have been admitted to countywide programs, regional programs, or programs specifically identified by the superintendent of schools as set forth above. Um, the process will include deadlines for submission of requests that align with the MCPS timelines for course registration and staffing needs. Such transfers will be permitted only if space is available after local students enroll. Um, and then this is the, the opportunities are for students to request academic transfers to participate in either a multi-year sequence of related courses as defined in the district or school course catalog that's not available at the student's home school or a multi-year single course sequence as defined in the district or school course catalog that is not available at the student's home school. Consistent with the, so let me just pause there for a second and let you before I move on to the next thing. <laughs> okay, so consistent with the district's strategic priorities, MCPS may also consider adjustments to academic programming at the student's home school in lieu of granting the academic transfer request. Can you um, just explain that? Yeah, mm -hmm, so the idea there is if there should be a, um, um, significant interest in moving to or from a particular school because of an ac uh, in search of an academic offering that then rather than granting the multitude of transfers to the new school it would be an, it would be recommended they consider adjusting the programming at the school of origin so adding so if if 20 students want to go from Walter Johnson to Whitman for Russian for example so one option would be to grant those transfers to go. Another option would be if the Russian teacher could go, come from Whitman to right. Walter Johnson, I lost my, uh, whichever way is right, uh, to, <laughs> for a period of the day and therefore satisfy the need that way. So just giving us flexibility that it's not an automatic if there's a programming solution to it as well. More likely if the person has a full schedule, we'll have to be hiring somebody else. Exactly. Right. Say, yeah. But we have done things like that, especially with mathematics. I think it most likely it's not going to be 20 kids from one school who are going to want to Usually go to not. take Russian. It would be a kid here and a kid there, and yeah. then I don't know how you address that. So, <coughs> um, so at starting at 247, MCPS reserves the right to require students to return to their home school if they withdraw from the course sequence for which the academic transfer request was granted. And finally, as um, can I before you do that final part mm -hmm. um, on line um, two sixty nine. I was confused. Any child who has older siblings who is enrolled in a language immersion program during the two thousand seventeen two thousand eighteen school year should it specify specific school years if if this is a continuing document. So this has this is this is the. Uh, grandfathering clause, if you will, for siblings in immer uh, recall that pr previously, if a mm -hmm. student ha if there was a child who had an older sibling in an immersion program, mm -hmm. then that younger sibling was a granted automatic enrollment in the immersion program, mm -hmm. and we are not providing that opportunity going forward. But we are looking, wanted to not not wanting to disadvantage families that had entered the program with that expectation. Right, and so you're so, saying this is the year that was the last year that it went. Mm -hmm. So if out? there was a family okay. that 
am I counting right, but it would be possible, certainly. If there was a family that had a kindergartner in 2017-18 school year, that child would be in, what, third grade now? Mm -hmm. And so then there's still opportunity for their younger siblings to come in directly admitted into the immersion program oh, yep. because they had an older sibling. that was the last year they were allowed to be part of the older sibling. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the last area of change is under desired outcomes number three. We're seeking to provide clarity that the COSA process is distinct from the admissions process for countywide programs, academic transfer requests, which is the new area we're discussing, and administrative placements initiated by MCPS staff, um, the criteria for which are established by the superintendent of school through administrative regulation. Okay. All right. Any other questions or concerns? Well, I, I guess this is something we would talk about at the full board, but, you know, I had mentioned um, before about um, we, we only grant courses for automatic courses for younger siblings, and I understand why, because we're saying that's making a, they've made a choice to, my concern was that if you have a younger sibling who gets into a foreign language program, for example, and you have another child who's at a different school that, and you'd like them to both go to the same school, we don't grant it because you made the choice to apply for your younger child to apply when you knew your older student was at another school. I, I think that that should be, I think I would like to see that be a discussion just because um, a lot of these, especially when they're lottery programs, they might apply, but they didn't, um, if the, your older student didn't get in, but your younger student did, to, to, to me to say, well, you have to choose either they don't go or whatever, I don't really understand that. I feel like if, they, if your family doesn't make it in the first round and then they get in the second time, could so it the potentially siblings. be where the older sibling would be able to transfer to Okay, so we're looking at the language starting on page four. Is that what you're referring to? I am, yeah, under okay. C, siblings. Uh, when a younger sibling seeks to attend a school, an older sibling will be enrolled in the regular school general program. Okay, so it is specific to the regular general school program or special ed program. So the, so the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it does speak to the magnet program, but you're going into the regular program. So your concern is at line 106 and 7. When it, when it distinguishes a younger and older, your thought would be just a sibling? Mm -hmm. Correct. Applying only, to, we're only speaking in reference to the magnet schools though? No. I mean, I'm, I'm not necessarily, but other than lottery things, I'm not really sure, but it, you know, especially if we're going to um, allow for transfers potentially based on academic programming, um, if there's room. And I know it wasn't in here for this go round, but um, I don't know where if the conversation is supposed to happen at the full board after we move I this think, along. Or I th our thinking would be the the board policy management committee gives us direction for the next step. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. For this section. For this section. So you're, you're saying that the younger sibling has been accepted into a program, so the older one would be able to come as well to make sure that the parents don't have to go to two different schools with mm -hmm. the students? I don't know. Just for clarification, in section um, one, C1, starting at 106, when a younger sibling seeks to attend the school where the older sibling will be enrolled in the regular slash general ed or special education program. So an other, another uh, scenario might be 
a younger child gets assi assigned to a school based on their uh, special education Correct. needs. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, you know, this doesn't provide the option for the exactly. third grade sibling to then come over to them. that school with them. Right. And that's all I'm trying to get is that I think that that should be able to be a consideration. If well, do you want to make an amendment for that? Or so that we can discuss that? Yeah. That. That's fine. Okay. No, I, I mean, I, I think you? for family ease, sanity, I mean, whether it's younger or older, um, you know, if you have a younger child with an IEP and they're placed at a school, it, you know, I mean, my two grandchildren, one in first grade and one in third grade, because they're in paired schools or in separate schools, it's a n not ideal. There is no other solution for my daughter, um, but it, you know, it makes life more complicated. So, I mean, I don't know that there's, a, sh uh, I, I'm agreeing with Rebecca. I think that younger or older in this, in these specific circumstances, mm -hmm. there they should be able to apply for a COSA. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if but, you did. I think that the, just to be clear, that the, the difference between these two provisions are that these are not the ordinary COSA rules for uh, hardship. These provisions right. say that these are, these are ways to, to, to uh, 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 receive a COSA even without a hardship. Right? Correct. Correct. And so. So your younger child is admitted to Rock Creek Forest Spanish immersion right. in kindergarten, and you have a third grader somewhere else. They're not going to go into the third grade right. Spanish immersion. Mm -hmm but they could go into the third grade general right. education program. Exactly. Right, and, and I think that the, the challenge has been with this, like so many other things, is space and capacity mm -hmm. and planning for space and capacity. If, if, if we have to plan for or, or, or take into consideration that uh, for when, when students come into the various admissions programs that their sibling is coming along with them, that just will, will cause a lot of different assumptions about space planning. Wouldn't it cause the exact same assumption if an older kid gets in and they have younger siblings? I mean, why is it different? Because you can plan for it. Well, right. you'd have to know that they have them if you're going to plan for it, similarly to the other. But they're, well, I mean, they're not necessarily, so there's, there's sort of a sequencing at that point, potentially, of kids moving through a school as opposed to a child being there and then folks coming in at the same time. But it, I mean, the sequencing could apply, apply either way. I think there's just a lot of questions. It's sort of what all this, <laughs> I think what, what we're all trying to do is sort of sort out the permutations to it. And I know, I guess one of the questions too would be whether, as you just said, the, the siblings would be coming back to the school or whether the siblings would be coming back to the program, because certainly that Which has, so, that, so. I, maybe but. I misheard you earlier then, because I think that was, that's another question certainly in terms of no, we've never said that you, they get into the program that their siblings in. It's just that they could attend the school and the general, um, general admission. But, like I said, for me the issue is that it. I don't believe it should just be for if you if you have an older sibling there. I think it should be if you've got a younger sibling there as well. And I, and I guess the 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 board members will need to decide whether. Um, this like the consortia issue do we want do we want to at this point be introducing new potential wrinkles because there are there are many including the ones that that were initially on the broader list that we focused on these do we want to use this process here and then at the broader board to go beyond the, the ones that people focused or not and I think that that's 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 just a point to tee up rather and and for us to take your direction in terms of what to decide well so I can't speak for my colleagues I'm just gonna say that I would say yes because I did bring it up when the when we were having the original discussions, and since um, so I wouldn't know where to bring it up other than here now. Otherwise, it's going to move to the full board, and then it'll just be the whole discussion, and then we're going back again. So. All right. Is that how it would work? Would go to the full board and then come back to us again? I think that. 
Um, I, I just want to kind of bring up the issue of capacity again. We're not just, we could possibly not no. just be talking about one sibling. Right. Some people, some families have three and four children. And right. so that creates even a, l a larger issue. So it's definitely worth looking into um, for making, making a decision. Yeah. Well, aren't all of these things more or less based on capacity avail and availability? Well, right. this this provision doesn't really, you know, allow for, uh, well, it says other Consideration of available classroom space, grade level enrollment, staffing allocations, or other factors that impact the schools. Mm. Should this be considered on a case-by-case -case basis? Should we do well, something like that? I mean, it is, they are considered on a case-by-case right. -case mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. because what would happen now is someone, you know, your child, your um, younger child is accepted into Spanish immersion and you would apply saying, this is my hardship, mm -hmm. this is my plea, mm -hmm. why my older child should go too. Right. And, for, and I just would like us to be able to open it up so that that can be considered, be taken into consideration for hardships. Similarly to the way it's almost, auto, you know, it's automatically done for a younger sibling with the exception of the such approval requires consideration of available classroom space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think we have to rule on that, you know, decide that everybody wants to do that because that's going to be a hardship on the committee that has to look at, at these individual cases, so. Well, that's why I was thinking, like, even if we just removed the word younger, so when a sibling seeks to attend the school where a sibling will be enrolled, or however, I don't know, I don't know. What so I want to be clear, are, are you guys saying that the implication of a language change like that would be in the planning process for um, any of the work that your office does? Do you see what I'm asking? So I, th I think part of our hesitation is that I think it covers and it, it would affect a number of different aspects to it. I mean, there's planning for the program capacity and planning for the school capacity. Um, those are two different things. They move together. Um, but again, I think it has implications for both. And I think these are um, some of the considerations that were discussed um, in previous discussions of this of this issue. I think um, that every time we the a category. Uh, for which a COSA may be granted is broadened or, or considered, then it, it um, if I'm using the right, exactly the right terminology, but there, it, it implicates consideration of, of capacity at, at, at a minimum. And so that, I think that's what you're, what you're hearing is that that's yet another um, potential impact on, on capacity. And we don't have data or anything to speak to this mm -hmm. particular topic. At well, and time. it is. It, I'm sorry, stuffing. No, I, I mean I think you know part of the part of the conundrum that we have with capacity here is that you know there's almost always capacity for one, right? So in most of our schools, as we know, are 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 at or above capacity. Um, when we start talking about large numbers, is where it gets more complicated. And again, as we're pointing out, it's hard to know what the numbers are here. So that that's sort of that question. Um, we don't have any you know hard rules about capacity um, because again, a lot of these case by case considerations can be accommodated. But if we look at large numbers, then we're just looking at a different uh, a different consideration. That's all. Can I just ask a question about timing? You know, so. If the policy committee recommends, you know, sending this draft to the full board, um, you know, what is the proposed timeline then uh, to get this done, to get these changes that are currently here? Will we make this COSA season? I will if tell we, you it's an extremely tight timeline. I know that the... Um, staff that works on the booklet that notifies the community about the process and so forth that that document is currently in development um, it's scheduled to go they usually go to the printer early mid-november to early december at the, at the at the latest because we know it has to get into schools and COSA season officially starts fe opens february 1st 
Um, so we are in a very tight window if there is an interest in having all of these um, offerings available for the upcoming COSA season. Um, and I think just con more, even more concretely, <clears throat> if this goes out for public comment at the next or an upcoming board meeting in November, then uh, comments would uh, comments would I mean uh, comments would come back for uh, uh, for this committee to review at its meeting. That's current. The next currently scheduled meeting is in January. Twenty seventh, the end of January. Right, and mm -hmm. so then it ha would have to go back to an another board meeting for final adoption, and ideally that would all happen before the. Um, before the COSA season opened on the first okay, school day in February. So I think that if the board's, if the committee and the board's interest is to have it, have this in place by the beginning of February, we may have to adjust some of those timelines, including potentially having a, this committee meeting earlier than the end of January. And I know that your schedules generally are jammed. So I think that that's just the consideration of, do, can we make that February 1st? Or is this something that we're trying to do for the next year and I think that's that's the direction where we need to take from you all I I think Miss Dixon's uh, new business item really intended for it to hit the mark for this COSA season so I mean I I think if we have to move our policy committee earlier in January we can certainly move the policy committee earlier in January but I think there is an interest of the board I mean it's been quite some time now that mm -hmm. I mean, we've had a couple of discussions. I would be willing to send this. I, I think there are still un, unknowns about the two areas that Ms. Um, Smondrowski raised, the consortia, the change in that process, and this sibling thing, although it can be um, amended at the board table when we take final action. But I think there needs to be some information. I. I, I really, my preference is to get going on this, that there are a number of changes here and we need to make them, you know, go forward. And there is nothing that stops us for the next season of making additional changes or if we have re other answers that when it comes to the full board um, at, at act tentative action that we can have that discussion or make those amendments. I'm comfortable with that. I just, I'm comfortable with that aspect of going to the full board and making amendments or whatever. I just, um, you know, I guess I've been on the board for seven years now, and, and I was looking, trying to look to see when it was, this was last amended, um, which was in 2017. Um, but um, I don't know how many, you know, generally we don't bring these policies back up again and again it's they well, they sit for a while but it's a complex we okay. have to. i mean as long as we do i just because we've been talking about making these changes for a lot of years and just one more timing piece uh, i'm reminded by uh our staff that the the booklet goes to press mm -hmm. in december so i think that that's that's ideally if we're trying to hit we're, we're trying for that so that that just is the the reality of some of these processes well I think maybe they may have to juggle with the press because <laughs> I think the board has a real interest in making some changes now for this next season and not waiting another year. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, um, you know, I, I normally don't think it's a good idea to be wordsmithing a policy at final action or tentative action at the board because it's you know we do need legal thinking you guys need to think but i'm going to move i move that we send this policy forward now and that you come with thoughts on miss those two areas um that miss mandraski raised the consortia and the sibling piece um so i'll second that are we all agreed okay Thank you. Can I, sorry, can I ask a clarification? So the one language change I heard in the discussion was around the um, the staff COSAs and the issue of um, any any concerns about child care. So that would be language that we would also bring to the right. full board mm -hmm. for tentative action? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
right. Child care plans or child, yeah. Yeah. or disruption of school day or duties. Kind of well, I, I think it's all those encompassed in, you know, uh, as you know, Mr. Neff explained. Uh, whenever it staff COSA requests are reviewed now for based on hardship, the question is always put forward: What is your child care plan? Because of the contract. All right, thank you. Okay. okay. All right, we're back. We're up to IDA school year calendar, and Ms. Williams will begin the discussion. We just wanted to give you an update um, uh, on the status of, of the policy. Um, as you know, it has it is out for public comment, and the public thirty and we've uh, opened the public comment. It's open for public comment from th for 30 days from the date that you took tentative action, the board took tentative action. So that uh, closes on November 8th. So we will come back to the board. Um, given the timing of all of the parts of the calendar and the final action and so forth, we're, we're suggesting we come back for um, discussion of the comments at the um, November 12th discussion of the calendar. And then, um, in lieu of another policy management committee meeting, and then um, when the calendar comes back to you again in December for final action, that we would bring the policy for final action at that same time. Um, so we just wanted to give you an update on uh, how we were going to manage that time, the timing of of taking uh, providing you an opportunity to take action. Um, and receiving public comment and working all that together. I think that makes sense. Ms. O'Neill? Yeah, um, no, I think that's fine. I just, you know, I mean, I think you have to put the horse before the cart, and I think our policy has to be adopted, or if there is a change, um, mm -hmm. first, before we take action, final action on the calendar. But ha have we gotten much response on the policy? To date, um, on the policy itself, we have received a total of 18 comments from the public. Um, as often as the case, not all of the comments speak directly to the change that's presented. So, um, we, but we've received a total of 18. Now, of course, the calendar itself is out for comment, and Ms. McGuire can speak to those that response rate. <clears throat> so we do have um, we have the calendar scenarios uh, on our website, and we have, um, in addition to a place where people can just provide whatever feedback they want to, um, we do have specific sort of survey questions for people to respond to, and the inauguration day question um, is one of those. Um, we also are linking there back to the policy comment page, and I think we have both pages linked to each other. But it's certainly possible that some folks are just sort of using this as their as their comment uh, window, and we do have. Um, a few thousand uh, responses on the calendar so um, so we, we I think <laughs> so I think we can um, you know hopefully look at that uh, those at, at those both those pieces of information together for context would it also be possible I just wondered you know I know um, in, in DC they close schools for logistical reasons because you've got part of the city blocked off because of the parade route, et cetera. Um, but could we find out from the surrounding jurisdictions, not just in Maryland, Prince George's, you know, Fairfax, Arlington, you know, Anne Arundel, those that border on DC, what, whether they're open or closed on inauguration day? Because I think it would be a useful comparison. I know elsewhere in the country, typically, schools are not closed um, and you know not all employers in the DC metro area are closed I mean the federal government is because it, but uh, you know it's not a federal holiday so I would just like to know what other school systems in the metropolitan area are doing All right. Um, I would just like to thank staff for the kind of work that you have done to produce this 
and the chart that went with it um, showing the schools that would be available to about a thousand people possibly in this area and also to staff who uh, put together all those charts about transfers to and from schools oh, for yeah. every every school that we have for I think three or four years starting with 15 16 17 that was an enormous amount of work and um, please tell your colleagues who did it or you did it thank you so much for that um, it's a useful piece of information but a lot of work so um, is there any reason not to adjourn is there any more to discuss okay um, may I have a motion for adjournment please Second. thank you <laughs> all in favor <laughs> okay thank you so thank much you for everything that you've done